Hello, dear students. The topic that we are going to study today is Indian Contract Act Contractual Capacity. Let us study what Indian Contract Act is before we study the term contractual capacity. Introduction Any commercial activity requires understanding among people concerned. This understanding is often reduced into writing to give effect to the intention of the parties. Such formal versions are known as contracts. These contracts define the rights and obligations of various parties to facilitate easy performance of the contractual obligations. The law relating to contracts in India is contained in Indian Contract Act 1872. The act was passed by British India and is based on the principles of English common law. It is applicable to all the states of India except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. It determines the circumstances in which promises made by the parties to a contract shall be legally binding on them. All of us enter into a number of contracts every day, knowingly or unknowingly. Each contract creates some rights and duties on the contracting parties. Hence, this legislation, Indian Contract Act of 1872, being of skeletal nature, deals with the enforcement of these rights and duties on the parties in India. Now, let us study the term contract and few other terms associated that will help us define the term contract. What is a contract? While all the contracts are agreements, all the agreements are not contracts. An agreement which is legally enforceable alone is a contract. Agreements which are not legally enforceable are not contracts but remain as void agreements which are not enforceable at all or as voidable agreements which are enforceable by only one of the parties to the agreement. The observation given would raise a question in our minds as to what is the exact meaning of the words agreement and contracts. An agreement is a promise or a commitment or a set of reciprocal promises or commitments. An agreement involves an offer or proposal by one person and acceptance of such offer or proposal by another person. If the agreement is capable of being enforced by law, then it becomes a contract. Now let us study at the definitions as per the Indian Contract Act. Section 2B of the Act, while defining a promise, provides that when the person to whom the proposal is made signifies his assent thereto, the proposal is said to be accepted. Thus, when proposal, when accepted, becomes a promise. Section 2E of the Act defines an agreement as every promise and every set of promises forming consideration for each other. Section 2H of the Act defines the term contract as an agreement enforceable by law. Section 2D of the Indian Contract Act defines consideration as when at the desire of the promisor, the promisee or any other person has done or abstained from doing or does or abstains from doing or promises to do or abstain from doing something such an act or abstinence or promise is called as the consideration for the promise. Consideration means quid pro quo that is something in return. Let us go ahead and study the term contractual capacity. What is contractual capacity? 
one of the essential elements required for a valid contract is that all the parties to it must have the capacity to enter into the contracts. The contracting parties must be competent to contract. Section 11 of the Act states that every person is competent to contract who is the age of majority according to the law to which he is subject and who is of sound mind and is not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject. Therefore, this section makes it clear that a person is incapable of entering into a contract if he is a minor of unsound mind and disqualified by law from contracting to which he is subject. Contracts entered into by such incompetent persons are void. Let us study them in details. The first is minor. Now, who is a minor? A minor is a person who is not yet a major, that is, a person who has not completed 18 years of age. However, in two cases, a minor is considered to attain majority only after the age of 21 years. The first case is where a guardian of a minor's person or property is appointed under the Guardians and Ward Act 1890 or the second scenario where the superintendence of minor's property is assumed by a court of wards. The special protection afforded to minors is premised on the logic that a minor's mind is not fully developed and hence he cannot decide as to what is good or bad. Due to their immaturity, a minor may be exploited or ill-treated by the majors. Hence, it becomes the duty of law to protect minors against exploitation arising out of their lack of knowledge and experience. In short, the approach of law is to not only protect minors, but at the same time ensure that no undue hardship is caused to the persons who deal with the minors. There are some rules regarding to an agreement with a minor. The law regarding agreement with or by minors may be summarized in the points as first one, minors agreement is void. An agreement with or by a minor is absolutely void ab initio. The term void ab initio means void from the very beginning. This rule was declared by the Privy Council in the famous case of the Mohori Baibi versus Tharmudas Ghosh. In this case, D, the said minor, entered into a contract for borrowing a sum of rupees 20,000 with a money lender. Out of that, the money lender paid the minor rupees 8,000. Then, the, the said minor executed mortgage of property in favor of the lender. Later, the minor wanted to set aside the mortgage. The money lender wanted a refund of the said amount. When the matter came up before the Privy Council, it held that since the agreement with the minor was void of initio, the question of refunding the said amount did not arise. Thus, the minor could get the mortgage set aside without paying the mortgage money. This rule is based on the logic that a minor is incapable of forming rational judgment vis a vis the effects of a contract on his own interest. The second important point is the minor can be a promisee or beneficiary. Any agreement which is beneficial to the minor and under which he has no obligation is valid. A minor can be a beneficiary and hence he may become a payee, an endorsee or a promisee under a contract. 
In other words, since a minor is entitled to the benefits arising from the contract, he as a logical corollary can file a suit to enforce his rights. Example, P agrees to sell his flat at Pune to a minor for rupees 5 lakhs. The minor pays 2 lakhs by way of advance. P refuses to sell his flat. Here, the said minor can enforce this agreement against P since it is meant for the benefit of the minor. The third important point is a minor's agreement cannot be ratified. When we say that a minor's agreement is void ab initio, it means that such an agreement does not exist in the eyes of law and hence it cannot be ratified by a minor even after he attains the age of majority. To ratify means to adopt or accept subsequently. The process of ratification goes back to the date of the making of the contract and therefore a contract which was then void cannot be made valid by subsequent ratification. Example, M is a minor who agrees to sell his car to Mr. N for rupees 1 lakh. This agreement could not be enforced by the minor on account of his being a minor. Hence, after attaining majority, M that is the minor wanted to ratify that is wanted to confirm or to approve this agreement, but he is not allowed to do so since a void agreement cannot be made valid one by any subsequent action. However, in such a case, he is free to make a new contract with the same terms. Fourth important point related to a minor is minor's liability in case of necessaries. A person who has supplied the necessaries to a minor or to those who are dependent on him is entitled to be reimbursed from the property of such minor. Now, you may ask what is necessary article? It is a relative factor depending on the uniqueness of each case. Hence, it may be determined on the basis of status and social position of the minor. In India, for example, food, clothing, shelter, education, health and marriage have been considered to be the necessaries. In this case, only the minor's property is liable. The minor personally is never liable. Another important point related to a minor is no compensation is payable by a minor. If a minor receives some benefits under an agreement which is void due to his minority, he cannot be compelled to refund such benefits or compensate for any benefit received. The next important point is the rule of estoppels does not apply to a minor. The rule of estoppel basically prevents a person from denying the truth of a statement or representation he has made as per the section 115 of the Evidence Act. However, the rule of estoppel does not apply to a minor who falsely impersonates to be a major and thereby induces another person to enter into an agreement with him. In this regard, if the aggrieved party proceeds to take action against such minor, the minor can take the plea that being a minor, he should not be held liable. In short, the minor here is not stopped from pleading his minority. However, if a minor is in possession of property which he has obtained fraudulently, representing that he was of full age, he will have to restore such property to its former owner. Similarly, a minor will have to restore to the person deceived any money received as a result of sale proceeds of the goods obtained by fraud. Though the law provides special protection to minors, it does not mean that it bestows upon them 
the privilege or right to cheat others. In this case, if a minor has fraudulently disposed of the property and spent the money received wherefrom, then such equitable doctrine of restitution cannot be evoked. Another important point is, there is no specific performance. No specific performance of a minor's agreement can be granted by the court against the minor as we know the minor's agreement is void. There is no insolvency. A minor cannot be declared insolvent even if there are dues payable from the properties of the minor. And partnership, being incompetent to contract, a minor cannot enter into a contract of partnership. However, a minor can be admitted into the benefits of a partnership firm. Only the minor's share in the firm will be held liable. His property, however, would not be held liable for the same. Another thing that will be, a minor can be an agent. He can bind the principal by his acts done in the course of such agency. However, he cannot be held liable for the minor's agreement. Next one, a minor cannot bind parent or guardian. The parents of a minor are not liable for agreements made by a minor even for necessaries. However, if a minor is acting as an agent of his parents, then the parents or guardians concerned can be held liable for the minor's agreement. Minor as a shareholder, a minor acting through his lawful guardian can become a shareholder or member of a company provided the shares are fully paid and the articles of association do not prohibit the same. Surety for a minor. If in a case of contract of guarantee, an audit stands surety for a minor. The adult is liable under the contract, but the minor is not liable since the contract in the instant case is directly between the surety and the third party. Minor's liability in tort. What is a tort? A tort is a civil wrong independent of contract for which the ordinary remedy is damages. Therefore, if the act of the minor lies outside the terms of contract, he can be made liable. A minor is liable tort unless the tort is in reality a breach of contract. The term tort covers various acts like assault, trespassing over immovable property, creating nuisance, etc. For example, a minor hired a horse for riding under express instructions not to jump. He sent the horse to one of his friends who jumped it where it was injured and ultimately died. The court held that minor liable because the act of a minor was not within the object and purpose of the hiring. The second category of the people are persons of unsound mind. According to section 11, only persons of sound mind can make a valid contract or enter into a valid contract. Therefore, contracts made by persons of unsound mind are void. Now, let us study the definition of sound mind. A person is said to be of sound mind for the purpose of making a contract if at the time when he makes it, he is capable of understanding it and of forming a rational judgment as to its effect upon his interest. If we analyze the definition, we can say that the persons who are incapable of understanding the nature and contents of the contract and incapable of forming a rational judgment about the effects of the contract on their interest are called as persons of unsound mind. Apart from this, there are persons who are considered to be persons of unsound mind. They are. The first one is an idiot. An idiot is a person who has completely lost his mental ability of thinking. 
he is absolutely incapable of forming a rational judgment and agreement with an idiot is completely void. The second is lunatic. A lunatic is a person whose mental faculties of thinking are deranged that is disordered due to some mental strains or other reasons. Here such a person suffers from alternative attacks of sanity and insanity. Such persons can form valid contract when they are of sound mind. Though all the agreements made by the lunatics are void, their agreements for necessaries of life are valid. Further, although a lunatic is not personally liable, his or her property is liable for the necessaries supplied to such a person. The next are drunk or intoxicated persons. A drunk or intoxicated person is one who is so drunk or intoxicated that he is not only incapable of understanding the terms of agreement but also is unable to form rational judgment as to the effects of the terms and condition of the agreement. Hence, an agreement made during such a drunken or intoxicated state is absolutely void. Hypnotism is the next criteria. A person who is under the influence of hypnotism enters a state of artificially induced sleep wherein he is rendered temporarily incapacitated. Hence, an agreement made by such a person under the aforesaid condition is void. The fifth is mental decay. Mental decay occurs on account of old age or sickness which also affects rational judgment. An agreement made by such a person will become void if they are unable to understand the terms of agreement. All agreements entered into by persons of unsound mind are absolutely void and inoperative against them, but these persons can derive benefits under such agreements. The third category is the persons disqualified by law. According to section 11, incompetent persons under the third category are disqualified from contracting by any law of which they are subject. The persons, those who come under this category are first one alien enemies. An alien person is a citizen of a foreign country. When a war is declared between the aforesaid person's country and the host country, for example in India, he becomes an alien enemy for all the legal purposes and hence cannot enter into any contract. The contracts made before the declaration of the war are either terminated or suspended during the continuance of war. However, the central government in its discretion may grant him permission to contract as well as to sue in an Indian court provided he is allowed to stay in India. Second is foreign sovereigns and ambassadors. A suit cannot be filed against such persons without the prior sanction of the central government. However, a suit can be filed against such persons if they voluntarily to the jurisdiction of the local courts. Third is insolvents. When a person is declared as an insolvent, his property thereafter vests in the official assignee or the receiver. An insolvent in such a case loses contractual powers over his property. Such a disqualification can however be removed by court's order of discharge. Fourth are the convicts. A convict is a person who has been found guilty and convicted of an offence. A convict cannot enter into a contract while he is undergoing imprisonment. The fifth are companies and corporations. Joint stock companies and corporations created are all artificial persons created by law. Does a contract entered into 
by such artificial persons will be valid only if it is within the powers conferred by the special act or memorandum of association. Thus, in this lecture, we started about the Indian Contract Act. What is a contract? What are the capacity of the parties to a contract? And who are the parties who are competent enough to enter into a contract? Thank you so much. Thank you.